participants in. We may as well start and uh, get it going. Um, hello, welcome everybody. I am Ian Williams. I'm president of the Foreign Press Association. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome back one of our distinguished alumni, um, Nina Shang, who was a beneficiary or a, a, a winning awardee of uh, Foreign Press Association scholarship, which um, I think she has kindly said helped launch her on her career <laughs> and uh, now writes about China money. And there's a lot of China, there's a lot of money, so there's much to write about. And her latest book is, let's hope we get this right. I don't know whether it comes out in reverse or not over, this, over the screen. Oh, it's correct, yes. Yes, US-China Tech War. What Chinese tech history teaches about future tech rivalry? And this is especially relevant this week because we did not know this, but um, this week is the latest salvos in the uh, China tech war. Uh, the PRC has released uh, two people who just happened to be not allowed to leave China and two outright hostages, the Canadians who were arrested and charged with things and miraculously found innocent the day that uh, CEO Meng was released. And um, I mean, I have my own strong opinions on that. The Canadians should never have arrested her. The Americans shouldn't have asked to be, to be arrested for an extra territorial offence. And But then the Chinese should not have arrested people as hostages who are innocent of the crimes against them. Nobody comes out looking good in this. So Nina has, um, has explored the history of technology and um, you sort of distinguish between um, the sort of, how should we say, esoteric science, the idea of science for its own sake and practicality as being slightly different concepts in China. And um, I'm being told I should adjust my picture because I'm, oh wait, I can pan it, there we go. Is that better, everybody? <laughs> and uh, it's a new camera, I'm playing with it. Uh, so Nina's, uh, Nina's thesis also brings us up to the moment and how the strategies for the development of silicon chip foundries have developed. And um, it's interesting, the mixture of sociology and politics and technology here, because the, the king, the emperor of the semi-chip world is still, the tang is still in Taiwan, isn't it? The Taiwan um semiconductor manufacturing they're, 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 they're still knocking knocking sinking the boats of all of the competition but it was been interesting to see china come in you you persistently develop in the book the idea that the chinese cadres the people charged with it have been if anything too short-termist in their approach they're not taking a long-term approach to the development of the silicon chip industry they recognize it's essential for china and Obviously, the U.S. recognizes that this is an essential item of competition. So uh, where would you say the state of the war was with Huawei, whether, <clears throat> whether there was any justification for what the Trump administration did against Huawei and uh, what part it played in, in the semiconductor wars? Um, so um, in terms of Huawei, what the U.S. has done to um, uh, uh, use sanction measures against Huawei, uh, the 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 reason, uh, stated reason by U.S. Uh, government is national security. Um, so uh, you know, uh, it's to uh, get um, perhaps less secure or uh, less ideal uh, te uh, telecommunication equipment makers out from US and its allies uh, telecommunication infrastructure. Um, so that ob objective has pretty much been um, uh, fulfilled as uh, many of US and its allies have pretty much banned or uh, partially banned um, Huawei equipment from its uh, uh, 5G uh, network infrastructure. But the, the I guess the, um, the, the correlated uh, victims of Huawei's uh, sanctions um, are two very important businesses that 
perhaps have less to do with national security. One is uh, Huawei's uh, semiconductor chip design unit called High Silicon. So High Silicon is a company that you know nobody actually know that much or have heard of um, you know, five, six years ago. It, it has been operating in the background for some time. It started very early actually, um, just a couple of years after Huawei was founded in the 1990s. So it's been around for a long time and Huawei has always used uh, high silicon uh, chips designed by high silicon, but manufactured by external um, semiconductor manufacturers like TSMC uh, to uh, on its own smartphone unit. Um, you know, before Trump came into the office, people didn't pay attention to this. This wasn't really important for people to, you know, to, to feel, oh, this Chinese phone maker is actually using uh, chips designed by itself. It wasn't a big issue, but it became a big issue after the sanction. And because of the sanction that Huawei High Silicon wasn't able to uh, use uh, uh, external uh, semi semiconductor manufacturer manufacturers like TSMC, this high silicon unit, which is the most advanced chip design company, the largest in scale, and um, perhaps, you know, with, uh, with capabilities uh, uh, equaling to the world's leaders, uh, which is really something unusual for China's tech companies. And high silicon currently is basically sitting in uh, limbo. It's continuing to uh, develop uh, design, you know, more advanced chips, but it cannot be manufactured. And, and so Huawei is spending uh, on the magnitude of billions of dollars, perhaps um, uh, to maintain the operation of high silicon in the hope that one day when, uh, you know, when manufacturing capabilities can be uh, somehow accessed by its unit, it can continue to use the chips designed by high silicon. So high silicon is one of the biggest co uh, collateral damage of uh, this Huawei sanction. Another obviously is Huawei cell phone, uh, smartphone unit, which you know, uh, had the chance to become the world's uh, biggest um, smartphone maker. But now of course, uh, it's probably going to, uh, it's already jumped, you know, dropped out of top five and it's probably going to uh, go further downward uh, in the future because it can't access uh, advanced chips. To what extent were the, the legitimate fears about the security implications of Huawei and its, uh, and its products? And, and to what extent was this simply um, uh, xenophobic and sinophobic trade wars being pursued by other means? Um, I cannot say for sure whether, you know, um, whether uh, it, it is uh, legitimate uh, concerns for national security. Uh, if you look at UK's argument, uh, the UK have done analysis of whether it can use 5G equipment in its 5G network. Uh, the, UK uh, uh, the UK regulators um, first believe that they can, they can put in measures to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, 5G network with uh, Huawei, semi, uh, Huawei uh, equipment can be secure. Um, but I think maybe it's not important because the intention here, of course, for the US is to maintain its technological supremacy and it's, you know, it's feeling threatened by China. And uh, the pretext, if you call it pretext, it doesn't matter. So it's, it wants to achieve its objective of keeping China technologically backward. And most importantly, to keep a stranglehold on China's tech sector so that China, uh, so that US can continue to have very strong leverage against China. This, you know, the US hasn't really used um, many of its, you know, weapons in its technological um, uh, uh, toolbox yet. It just used a couple and you know look at the the damage it has caused uh, to China's tech sector so the US doesn't want to want to lose its edge so you're, it's you're implying your, that yeah you're implying your book Nina that there's there is obviously short-term damage but in the long term it's forcing China into self-sufficiency it's forcing China into avenues 
that the Chinese companies are now having to explore manufacturing and other avenues that before they hadn't really bothered with. And, uh, you know, the, 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 they are teaming up and, and trying to pick the brains of, uh, of, of the Taiwan giants to build their own industry mm -hmm. and they're even reconfiguring their corporate structures in order to deal with this so you could consider this counterproductive in a way exactly but just think about the alternative which is the us does nothing then china will be able to catch up much faster um so with what the us has done it is going to slow down uh, the process of China progressing technologically, and it's going to prolong the time for China to catch up. So I guess, you know, if you compare the two options, then perhaps it's better for the U.S. to, to do something too. But in, to, in the meantime, what the U.S. is doing is it, it, it's putting truth in all the rumors that Chinese nationalists with a small N, and uh, it, it's also really calling into question just how far can it go with this? Because the U.S. needs China as much as China needs the U.S., surely, in many ways. Uh, yes, and I think the Biden administration has done really good, um, I guess, good changes in terms of always using competition to frame the U.S.-China dynamic instead of, you know, um, uh, perhaps using some, some much more uh, 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 headline grabbing uh, words. So competition is, is a good framework to think about future US-China tech uh, rivalry. Um, and I think, you know, both sides are, are operating from for their own interest. Uh, the US is doing, it thinks uh, is the best for itself, which is to maintain its supremacy and to maintain the stranglehold on China. And China previously, um, you know, they uh, pre previously Chinese government understood uh, crystal clearly that uh, it is reliant on foreign technology and this must change. But for decades, it was, it, it didn't make, you know, great progress, particularly in the, the, the fields of what we call like hard technology. You know, we're not talking about software, we're not talking about mobile apps, we're talking about semiconductor, we're talking about machine tools and engines. You know, so those areas are extremely hard for China to catch up. And despite government policies to encourage the whole industry to, you know, I guess, try to try to uh, make progress on those areas, it hasn't really uh, made much uh, achievement uh, so far. So uh, so here we are. Well, th that's one of the interesting things from the book is, you know, traditionally uh, being a European style social democrat, I always assume the governments took the long term view. And what, what you're describing of the Chinese political industrial scene is that the, the cadres, the party officials involved, have actually been taking quite a short term view of, of the growth of the industry. They haven't been looking at the long view. I mean, yes. if I were a paranoid Trump supporter, I would assume that the Chinese government was subsidizing Huawei, was was putting money into in, into the the, the silicone company, high silicon company, and uh, was was prepared to bankroll it for the siege. But there's no signs of that, are there? Um, I, I think I think you know if you look at uh, the the policies coming out from Beijing, we've already sort of you know seen uh, uh, several generations of uh, iterations, you know, from from the era of of uh, Hu Jintao, it was uh, mass entrepreneurship and uh, mass innovation. And, you know, we, we, ch we see, we've seen the changing uh, re uh, uh, rhetoric in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the framework, but, but like you say, uh, the, 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 the government officials who's in charge of, you know, implementing these policies, they have, they don't have a 10 year, 20 year horizon. They have a four year, five year horizon because they, you know, they, they're thinking about their own promotion. So what's important for them is to, um, you know, uh, add as much achievement on their resume so they can hopefully go to the next better and higher uh, official position. Um, so in the book, book I describe in the 1990s, uh, one of the semiconductor, the national semiconductor projects, 
uh, how it was done is really short term. It was, you know, focusing on setting up this production line and achieving a certain uh, manufacturing node. And that's all it wants to do, whether Chinese companies were able to absorb this technology and were able to, you know, somehow somehow turn that expertise into something commercially viable is beyond their, their, the officials' um, consideration. So that's why those type of projects really didn't work well. I just thought, uh, it just reminded me um, in, in my age and longevity, in 1970, I was in Shanghai and I went to a backstreet workshop where they were making silicone chips with cameras, it was a sort of great leap forward style stuff. You know, they had camera setups, they were doing the chips, they were doing the lithography. Um, and, you know, it was remarkably advanced under the circumstances, except they were venting hydrofluoric acid out through a chimney into the street outside. <laughs> so there were drawbacks to this great leap forward at the time. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I was surprised, you know, that with beginnings like that and the entrepreneurial activities of China, what's what, what's been the serious uh, inhibition in China to uh, developing? Is it is it that the scale of the semiconductor industry, as you imply in the book, is it, it just takes so much capital investment and and you know like all investment, it's in the nature of competition. You have to be prepared to lose that you might put the billions of dollars into the wrong technique and be outflanked completely. Is that entrepreneurial spirit still available in China? Um, yeah, for sure. I think those uh, the entrepreneur um, community in China is very much uh, thriving. Uh, in terms of why China wasn't able to, you know, uh, achieve a certain degree of self-reliance on semiconductors. It's really, you know, three decades of uh, policy mistakes, missed opportunities, and, and just the industry evolving so rapidly. And it's just so hard for uh, people, you know, for, for, for countries who are, who are behind to catch up, especially nowadays, you know, we're, we're in the 2020s now. In the 1970s, you can, you can if you know, you know if you, you're just starting out in semiconductors, you can probably catch up uh, rather, you know, rather um, not easy, but definitely with much less hurdle than today. You know, today the industry has become uh, so much more complicated and so much more dependent uh, on scale and uh, super advanced technology. So it, it's just becomes harder and harder. So I guess the laggards stay as laggards and the people who are ahead because they're so big, they have the scale, they have the resources for massive R&D spending, they are more likely to stay ahead. So the industry has come into this cycle where, you know, becoming super hard for uh, latecomers to, to catch up and becoming more, you know, easier for, for the people who are staying ahead to stay ahead. Mm -hmm. well, we have some questions from Bill Holstein, uh, a former president of the Overseas Press Club and uh, longtime China correspondent who has also written on technology. And uh, he's often talked about the depredations of Chinese companies. Um, I'm, he gets more indignant about it than me. And of course they steal. Everyone steals. <laughs> so, but China's, uh, he, he's written several works proving that China is, has in fact been ripping off American technology in a big way, which I think you imply in your own book is, is truth as well. But um, do you feel that the Biden administration, he wants to know, has a real strategy to halt China's penetration of American computer systems and its espionage in, in uh, American laboratories? So, so to what extent do you think that, um, that, that, that the Chinese industrial rise is based on this kleptocracy? <laughs> Actually, I, I think in the book, I, I made it clear that I do not think forced technology transfer or IP theft uh, sits at the foundation of China's technological development. The foundation and the main driver for China's technological development during the past several decades have been global integration and China's, um, China's turning, you know, uh, turning to the market economy. So um, I think on the US side, uh, it is common for people to sort of 
contribute what China has achieved in technology to force te technology transfer and uh, IP theft. Uh, I think it's a misperception. And um, just for one example uh, in semiconductors, uh, I quote in the book uh, from this uh, Hyundai, the South Korean semiconductor company, uh, CEO uh, was talking about how um, it doesn't, you know, he wasn't concerned about uh, 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 forced technology transfer in China because uh, he said, you know, even if, even if we have the machines there, um, the Chinese workers wouldn't even know how to operate them. It's the, it's the know-how that you cannot force. And also multinational companies operating in China with, you know, very advanced technology, they're very, uh, very concerned and they're well aware of um, when they form a joint venture with Chinese companies, there is a danger that, you know, uh, the Chinese partner would want to learn or try to, you know, uh, squeeze as much uh, advanced technology uh, from the joint venture as possible. So, of course, they have uh, a system uh, in place to prevent that from, from happening. Uh, I've, I've, um, uh, one of the studies uh, found that multinational companies operating in China uh, most of them, uh, you know, rely on a number of different strategies to prevent uh, forced technology transfer. One is to not bring your most advanced technology to China, just keep them outside of China. And I think this is a very common strategy engaged by these companies to, to prevent that. And, and lastly, just to think about a, a, a technology company, um, you know, going to China, set up a joint venture with a Chinese partner, and not thinking about protecting their own IP or their own technology is outrageous. No company would do that. And of course, uh, you know, to say that they're being forced and they have to do something, um, I think in some cases it's true, but we cannot attribute China's entire technological achievement on this one, sec uh, one factor. So like I said, uh, main, the main driver is still how China became a part of the global supply chain, how China integrated with the global technological ecosystem. That's why China was able to um, achieve what it did in technology. And another thing is on China's perspective, China would think, oh, well, one popular, you know, one popular perspective in China is that this is, you know, what China achieved is all because of how government smartly planned everything. I think that's also perhaps not, uh, not uh, the main reason. Um, uh, the the re uh, the 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 if you look at the most advanced technological areas in China, you know, it's it's internet companies, the giant internet platforms like Alibaba and Tencent. These places are not planned by government. You know, these companies are mostly private, uh, privately uh, financed by private investors, founded by entrepreneurs. They pretty much thrived because of government not, you know, not actually giving them uh, much thought or, you know, leaving, uh, leaving them um, to compete in the marketplace. So uh, the places where government intervened or supported heavily, um, it's a mixed cases. You know, it's not always 100% success. And there have been numerous studies about government subsidies to companies and to what e e effect uh, those sub subsidies are effective. And uh, the study, most of the studies turn out to, to show that sub subsidies usually don't, do not produce desired results. So, subsidizing the wrong companies to make the wrong things was just a way in China. The in China in, in some sectors, sub so these subsidies tend to um, uh, support uh, many commercially um, viable companies. So you know, uh, pumping up companies who really doesn't have uh, much uh, technological te technological expertise. Uh, uh, they are using this money to uh, engage in price wars and pushing price lower and lower and therefore actually minimize the chance for them to, to, to innovate. So it has the opposite uh, effect sometimes in terms of supporting innovation. Well, when you're describing the growth of the Chinese semiconductor industry, it's not so much technology transfer, I get the impression, as personnel transfer. 
Exactly. There's yeah. a list of highly, I mean, it, as you know, once again, taking it from a socialist point of view, the workers are in control. <laughs> the, 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 the people who, who make the things are the ones whose technology is transferable. They can get mm -hmm. on a plane and they, exactly. they don't need a briefcase full of, uh, of blueprints and, and so like, exactly. this is the fact they can walk off the plane and into a factory and mm -hmm. have the overall technology, the methodology. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of how to make these things and how you innovate. Exactly. And I think you make the very pertinent point that, uh, that it's not so much they bring technology, but they can warn companies of what's a dead end. No, I yeah. If I were you, I wouldn't go down there for exactly. say, Samsung exactly. if you were doing it. Yes. So, you know, when you think, think about technology transfer, um, you know, it's often a, a joke among uh, Western engineers, like, you know, I can just give you my, my blueprint for this machine, you know, I can give to China and nobody would, would know uh, what to do with it. And so, so really, so in some of the very advanced technology areas, um, theft or forced technology tra transfer really don't work, but the people, the talent are the key. So in semiconductor, like uh, Shanghai uh, International Semiconductor, uh, uh, group. So um, as I am um, so you know the the leader from a former TSMC executive um, and hundreds of Taiwanese uh, professionals migrating from Taiwan to mainland to Shanghai to set up SMC is actually perhaps the 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 largest scale technology transfer you can think of because the kind of expertise and know-how that this team brings to, uh, to China um, is perhaps you know, much, much more important than, than stealing, uh, uh, stealing the, the tappy uh, robot <laughs> IP by Huawei from T-Mobile. So, so that's why I, 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 I do um, strongly support the, the, the idea that we need to think about China's technological development as a result of globalized supply chain and China's integration with the world, uh, mm -hmm. not as a result of forced technology transfer or IP theft, even though they do happen and they do play a role, but I do not think those are the major reasons. One of the issues that keeps coming up now is, of course, the role of AI. And... Uh, you're sort of a bit ambivalent about this because artificial intelligence is on that sort of esoteric, uh, beyond practicality science that you said there's a, you imply is a traditional divide in China between you know making things and thinking about how they work. Uh, is 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 China poised? Is China able to exploit the its advantages to develop AI in a big way? Right, so here I want to uh, introduce another very important concept um, about uh, how countries um, uh, support or how countries innovate. So uh, there are many different models, but because we're talking about US-China, let's talk about US and China's different models. So the US model, I would call it technology-driven. So think about how, um, uh, the engineers in the 1950s invented transistors. This is an invention that took place in the lab and it's a groundbreaking invention that's going to change a whole industry. And from the lab, it went to the market. So Silicon Valley company startups like um, Fairchild and Intel was established uh, based on this invention. So, and later these companies became the leader in the semiconductor industry. This process is totally technology driven. It's a technology, it's an invention that drove a whole industry's growth. But China's innovation model is what I call market driven. So rarely do you see uh, Chinese tech companies is driven by an invention or a new technology. It is market driven. So uh, think about BYD, which is China, uh, uh, one of China's biggest uh, electric vehicle companies. Um, you know, none of the technology the company engages uh, is new or invented by itself. It's all mature technology, but the invention exists in how the company organizes its uh, business operations. Um, it uh, purposefully um, 
lowered the ratio of robots it uses in its factories because the idea is it's going to you know compete in the market by low prices and therefore their invention is we're going to use as much uh, human labor as possible because human labor in China is cheap. So, so uh, and or think about uh, DJI, which is you know the Chinese drone company. How they invented, uh, how they sort of through market design. You know, thinking about designing a product for a new niche market, which is consumer drones. So they're market driven, not technology driven. So. Uh, oh, so this is, I guess, a common, a, a quite different innovation model for both countries. Um, therefore, when we talk about AI, we have to think about in China, AI is a market driven innovation. It's not about China inventing, you know, a new framework, a new algorithm. All those are happening in the US. It's technology driven in the US. So, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, the, 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 um, the the land uh, the landmark um, uh, uh, AlphaGo uh, wins by uh, by uh, by uh, first at the British company but then later acquired by Google mm -hmm. of course so um, so those drove the whole industry's innovation in terms of AI applications in the latest you know in the latest wave. Uh, so that's a US model, but in China, it's going to be market driven. So it's not about inventing a new framework. It's about, okay, now we have this framework, we have this algorithm, how do we make them design the product, design a solution that's going to really become the best value, best price product for this sector. So China in that aspect is doing great work. And of course, uh, you know, uh, you can also call that application. So uh, we've seen China sort of massively applying AI application in a number of different fields, much more, uh, I, I guess, much more deep, uh, much more deeper and more uh, widespread than any other country in public security, um, in education, uh, in uh, in uh, com uh, 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 commercial property um, and in healthcare. So China is going to be continue to, to be strong in that, uh, in that application uh, arena. Uh, while in the US and, and perhaps in Europe also, um, there have been a lot of, um, I guess, resistance to certain applications. And so that's going to be a divert diverging trend going forward. Uh, if you think about, you know, maybe five to 10 years later, we're going to have a very uneven um, global cyberspace uh, in terms of AI usage and, and many other aspects like data transfer, cross-border data transfer, uh, et cetera. So, so I see like in the future, we're going to have the, 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 the global internet space or global cyberspace are going to be less standardized, more uneven, and uh, it's going to create a lot more, you know, unknown challenges for us. I suppose the Chinese security services provide a large and assured domestic market for this type of innovation is one way of looking at it. Um, so they're responding to market forces in their own uh, idiosyncratic way. Um, so, yeah, two markets includes two governments. Government in China is, you know, one one of the one of the very big market for for a lot of suppliers. Um, government procurement in China is a huge sector, and lots of companies cater to it. Well, uh, Bill Holstein uh, also comes back to ask you what you make of G uh, of Xi's um, crackdown on Alibaba, Didi, and the other Chinese technology leaders. I mean, what's the, is, is that because they're getting too big for their boots and are a domestic power threat? Or doesn't he like what they're doing technologically or think it's not the appropriate market response in, a global, in global terms? So in this, I feel like uh, we can look at this issue from two aspects. One is to control, another is to correct. So to control means the government does feel that um, it needs to take more control of data, of power. Um, so uh, the most, uh, in, I guess, the most relevant example is uh, Ant Group's credit rating unit. Um, so China spooky. Central Bank, <laughs> yeah, China Central Bank have tried for years to have private companies, you know, gather together to set up a national credit rating agency. And the private companies weren't cooperating. 
Um, so this has been happening for many years. Uh, the government said, okay, these eight companies, you work together for, you know, find a way so that we can somehow have a national credit uh, rating agency. Because think about nowadays in China, most of the people's transactions and their spending and their savings are happening on their phone. Nobody's going to a bank branch to do that. So the bank, the state-owned bank system are not having any not, not having much you know, relevant data to consumer spending and, and savings. So they need this data um, quite um, uh, earnestly. And, and so failing that, I think now the government is perhaps using a more stronger approach to, to, to make sure to take back some of the control of those data and, uh, and the power that comes with it. But so they're expanding we... it into social control, aren't they? It's as though I went down to the subway and tried to buy a ticket and discovered my FICO store had just dropped so they wouldn't sell me a, a subway ticket. Right, that's a different system called social credit rating, a uh, social, uh, I think social social credit rating. Oh, they're not tied one. in together. Right, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. So we're talking about purely a financial uh, credit rating system. And so now uh, the government has set up joint venture with Ant Group unit uh, so that they're going to have a joint venture where um, uh, where the government, I think, owns majority uh, stake, and then they're going to have access to uh, the all the all the credit data, and and therefore uh, also owning a majority stake of this joint venture. That's going to be the basis for a national credit rating agency. So part of this is control. So this is one example. There are many others, and then another is to correct because. Um, the, 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 the Chinese internet sector has been growing unfettered for decades and they have created uh, lots of social cultural issues, uh, you know, use addiction to gaming and 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 um, perhaps, you know, too much uh, after school tutoring and all that. So uh, this is to correct some of the things that people have complained and, uh, you know, over collection of personal data and very uh, minimum uh, amount of uh, legal protection for personal information protection. So, so those are good intentioned uh, policies to to try to correct social ills or or people's uh, you know complaints uh, for a long time. But um, even in these areas, uh, the the policy tend to, I guess you know perhaps are are too abrupt uh, and. And we're seeing, you know, some of some of the, I guess, sort of the most abrupt policy making and, and implementation in China for some time. Like the after tutor, uh, after school tutoring service, like it was, it was uh, released um, uh, in the summer and it was implemented across country very rapidly. So there are many parents who planned to have their children in, you know, enroll in a private school, for example, and they arrange their housing, you know, rented apartments, and they arrange their work around that. And then suddenly, you know, next week you have to move to a to a public school. So there's so many families who are, you know, whose life is completely thrown upset, set down by this new policy, and they have to move their work and they have to, you know, find new arrangement and all that, and including the latest news about. Um, uh, about uh, China preserving energy and therefore cutting uh, electricity supply in certain areas in the northeast. So, so I, I guess this is a little puzzling in terms of you know policy making and implementation. Uh, it's it's quite abrupt and very sort of brutal manners of implementing such drastic policies. Um, uh, I do feel the Chinese government need to somehow uh, uh, try to. Uh, you know, set the bottom line of, of, of their intentions and, and slowly, I guess, you know, um, uh, let people, um, uh, let people understand what their true intention is. Otherwise, you know, if you keep having this kind of drastic policies abruptly, it's, it's very disruptive. It's almost um, back to the old Maoist days, isn't it, where, you know, the chairman would wake up in the morning and have a bright idea and the following day everyone would follow it or else so you, you've got this caprice to the nanny state, a capriciousness where, you know, the, 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 this is for your own good. You better take the medicine or I'll force it down you. I, I hope it's not that bad yet, but, <laughs> but, but it is concerning for sure. And I think, you know, from my personal experience, I, you know, the people, the contacts I have in China who are investors, who are entrepreneurs, uh, who, who are mostly staying, you know, optimistic. 
Um, and uh, they are, they continue to believe that there are still lots of opportunities to invest in China. Uh, there are still opportunities to fund the company and try to achieve success. But perhaps outside of China, especially here, I hear more pessimistic views about where China is going in the future. So we do see this sort of dichotomy of, of uh, very different opposing uh, viewpoints and, and attitudes towards um, China's future. One of the issues here has been uh, the cryptocurrencies that China was moving into with full blast uh, with or without the semiconductors from TSMC, <laughs> there were plenty of places minting cryptocurrency, and now it's just stopped the flick of a wrist. Um, is, is this about control, or is it because they genuinely don't believe in cryptocurrencies? They think it's a scam? What, what's the attitude? Well, it has been going on for a long time. The the you know for several years, first uh, China banned mining and then banned trading and banned exchanges. So it's been a long time in the coming. And I think the latest policy is pretty much you know taking place after they banned most of the important functions of the the crypto market in China already. Um, uh, I think most people have found loopholes to somehow still engage in it because it is decentralized uh, platforms and, you know. Which is um, why the government doesn't like it. Just <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, and most people believe that this is to pave the way for China's own um, government issued uh, digital currency. Will people trust the, the government owned? There's, a, there's an amazing degree of trust in the government, isn't there, on polls in China? Yes. So, so that's that's also a very different part different part about um, the difference between U.S. and China. Like people people in China generally believe in the government. So if your company has somehow have government backing, then you're so much more trustworthy. And and I guess the opposite maybe you know not so true uh, in this country. Um, so. You know, we'll, we'll have to see, I guess, when if when China released its own um, government uh, digital currency, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be enough people who are very enthusiastic about it. Um, what about people outside? Will people be queuing to buy um, <laughs> crypto renmin rubao? <laughs> <laughs> that I, I, I can't say. Um, We'll have to say, and you know, there has been so much delay about this uh, digital RMB. The, so um, you know, it's been talked about for for, for years already, and um, so we'll have to wait and see when it does come out finally. But coming back to our original core and the core of your book, in many ways, is the Chinese system capable of producing the innovation and the drive and the investment to maintain a, a technological lead or to, to close the gap technologically with, with the US? I think that, that, that depends on which sector you're talking about. So if you're talking about, um, you know, like internet and, and uh, mobile apps or future 5G based uh, applications, and I think China will continue to stay strong on those aspects. But if you're talking about, you know, semiconductors, airplane engines, or uh, machine tools, you know, advanced manufacturing, then that's going to take some time for China to catch up. So um, we, we must not talk about technology as one sector. Um, we know technology, you know, encompasses such a huge array of different industries and each industry was distinct um, uh, uh, growth dynamics and, and they're very different from each other. So we cannot talk about them as, uh, as one. So I think in the future, uh, China will be strong in certain aspects and they will continue to lag behind in other aspects. Uh, the places where China will, you know, continue to be strong includes, you know, the, the softer technology, you know, what I mentioned about 5G based applications. I imagine because of 5G in your uh, rollout in China has been so much ahead of other countries, uh, companies will be able to design and produce uh, applications based on 5G, either it's consumer facing or industrial applications. I think China will have a chance to really be advanced in those places. Um, and, and in others, you know, like 
the harder technology, then China will struggle still for the next one to two decades. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just thinking of the type of human skills to build an aircraft engine or a foundry, like you mentioned. Uh, it's, it's only slightly relevant. Do you remember about 20 years ago when I first came to America, they were suddenly going around dragging retired nuclear engineers out of the retirement homes because they realized they had all of these plans, but they didn't know anyone who knew how to build an atom bomb anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The bits how far can you push with that screwdriver before it blows up? <laughs> These were not written down. It was a uh, it, it was the type of um, human technology that, uh, that 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 goes missing, um, and it's very difficult yeah. to reconstruct when it's gone. Yeah. No. Another sector is like private uh, commercial launch companies like SpaceX. Uh, we know that in China there there have been a, a number of different startups that have raised a lot of money to try to sort of copy SpaceX um, success, and um, it's just not going to translate. You know, quickly. Uh, SpaceX have taken you know 20, 20 years to build what it has. It took uh, dozens of um, you know explosions of rockets to to achieve the kind of you know technological sophistication it has now. Nobody can steal that. You know the SpaceX. You can you can have a team of Chinese entrepreneurs and live in the you know SpaceX headquarters. They won't be able to uh, replicate something similar. So, um, so that's the, the kind of you know a learning curve uh, Chinese companies are facing in the harder technology area, um, uh, and they cannot be it, you just cannot squeeze that timeline. It's just going to take a long time. So I, I I feel kind of ironic that Beijing's policies has always been so progress uh, progressive in terms of you know setting goals of twenty thirty achieving. Uh, total self-reliance uh, in key technological areas. They know they're not going to achieve that. They've said that uh, you know, for the past few decades that they want to achieve this many times. And each time they haven't uh, been able to do it. And in the future, they will continue again to see that it's not going to be done in three years. It's not going to be done in five years. It's going to take a lot, a lot longer than they are planning. And I think this mentality in, you know, in the policymakers' mind is is really not healthy. Um, they, you know, they they tend to tend to sort of think of this as something that can be done quickly, but but they're 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 failing to or refusing to recognize that this is going to take consistent, persistent effort for a long period of time. And this that's is something that, that's not emphasized by the policymakers. It's not emphasized by the business community. Uh, it's not emphasized by, by investors. So, so you know, this, these are all the challenges China have to overcome if they, they want to achieve some sort of uh, self-reliance. With um, is current state, is Huawei going to come back? Is it... Uh... Is the field open for it to start expanding its 5G enterprise now that the two Michaels are out and the other two people and CEO Meng is out? And, you know, every, every, everybody's got out of jail, not quite free. <laughs> Everyone will collect 200 million yuan. <laughs> um, how is it going to go from now? Um, Huawei is... Um doing a, a number of different uh, strategic transitions in order to uh, survive and thrive in the future. Uh, it is trying to become a softer company. So, you know, it has emphasized building uh, its uh, operating system that's going to, uh, uh, that's going to uh, somehow take a leadership position, at least in China's IoT sector. Uh, and it's also trying to, you know, build up its cloud business. And, and, and so it's trying to become a more softer company because, um, as I said before, the smartphone business, the chip design unit, you know, the two crown, dream, uh, crown jewels of, of Huawei are pretty much in limbo. Uh, if policies um, don't change in the future, they're likely going to be, you know. No, that's the point I was making. Are those policies likely to change with the... Um... The, the political changes, the fact that hostages have been released and everyone seems to be kissing and making up. I, I don't, I, I think it's unlikely because like, like we said before, <coughs> the, the intention of the US is to keep China behind. And if it, it wants to keep China behind, they first have to keep China behind in chip design. Chip design is 
much easier than than uh, chip manufacturing. And China actually has, you know, uh, Huawei's high silicon as a very advanced chip design company. So if China, if the U.S. wants to keep China behind in chips, then it has to keep high silicon out of business. So I I, I do not. I think you know if the U.S. continues its strategic uh, direction, which is to sort of um, uh, sort of uh, prevent China's technological pro progress, then then it wouldn't relax its uh, its policies. But if High Silicon hoists up a large banner on the internet and says, "Lots of money for anyone from Silicon Valley who wants to come and join us," what can the U.S. do about it in the end? Wait, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Well, we're talking about the personnel transfer of, of mm -hmm. technology. Um, if 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 high, if high silicon gets up there and says there's oodles of money available to anyone from Silicon Valley or Taipei who wants to come over and join us, um, is there anything anyone can do to stop them? Will the Chinese the court is, enforce a no compete um, <laughs> a no compete clause on the China on a te non technologist from? from California who moved to Beijing or Shanghai? Well, the thing is the semiconductor supply chain is so long and so complicated. Even if you have the talent, you wouldn't have the equipment. Even if you have the equipment, you wouldn't have the materials. And if you don't have the materials, then you know any, any missing link, it's not going to work. So the US holds, um, you know, holds tight, a tight grip on many of those links. Um, currently it's using the manufacturing capabilities um, and also, of course, uh, key equipment like uh, lithography machines. Um, and it hasn't really, you know, stopped or prevented companies, some companies from using the EDA design software. So if it decides to do that, then a lot more Chinese uh, chip companies will fall victim and they will be, a, they, you know, they won't be able to even design chips. So, um, so yeah, so the U.S. Are, can, can pretty much uh, stop China from progressing uh, in semiconductor very easily. It has so many different tools. And it's it can just slow, using very little now. I thought mm -hmm. the point of it was you could say it would slow it down, but not, not necessarily stop it. Yeah. So 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 now China is all about building a cell, you know, domestic replacement system, uh, not only you know in semiconductor, but also actually in uh, in its information infrastructure, uh, including uh, the chip structures, uh, whether it's x86 uh, or uh, whether it's uh, AMD uh, or some other sort of uh, self-developed uh, uh, chip structure uh, to operating systems and also to apps. And those are not, you know, not going as well as Beijing is hoping. Um, but coming back to semiconductors, um, uh, so uh, even, um, so even if like the U.S., um, there, there are just so many different choke points. It's just uh, China wanting to build its own entire semiconductor uh, supply chain is pretty much impossible. So it has to somehow use external parties where it can uh, use in order to build something what I call sanction free. It's not 100% self-reliant because it's pretty impossible to build the entire supply chain as self-reliant, but it can be sanction free. That means the US cannot sanction it. But because of US leading position across the semiconductor supply chain, even trying to you know, secure certain elements or certain links across the semiconductor supply chain from parties, third parties, where it can be free of US sanctions is very difficult. So, but there are still some possi possible places where China will be able to use external third party suppliers to fill that, uh, that, uh, that blank. But, but still it's, 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 it's um, it's going to take some time. It's not entirely possible. Like I said, that's why it's going to take, you know, one, two decades or more. Um, they have to first start with the mature technology, like Huawei is building the 45 nanometer uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturing plant. So, you know, uh, they're supposed to build this up this year and there's no news so far. And uh, the lithography machine by Shanghai Micro Electronics, which is supposed to come out in 20, uh, this year, at the end of this year, uh, still no news so far. So I imagine probably some delay there. And even if they have the machine out, uh, it's going to take a, a year or so to, to you know, put in production and try to experiment with uh, scaled production and all that. It's going to take another 
you know, several years for them to actually master the, the mature technology. And, and while at the same time, don't forget other companies are progressing rapidly. Uh, TSMC already, uh, you know, experimenting with uh, two, uh, two nanometers. So, you know, while China's struggling on 45 nanometers. So, yeah, like I said, it's just so, so much harder. So there's some up. party caters in Shanghai whose promotion prospects are being blighted at the moment, <laughs> unless, the, unless they work very quickly. Mm. There's a, so I, this is um, we're coming to the end. Uh, very thankful for Nina Shang, our most distinguished alumna from uh, the Foreign Press Association at the moment. Um, uh, welcome back to the US. And if you're coming to New York, do come and see us. Uh, her book, which you mustn't forget, US-China Tech War, What Chinese Tech History Reveals About Future Tech Rivalry. And Thank you. Wrote it explores the history of China technology development and illustrates how this saga of innovation shapes current and future tech classes, to clashes between the US and China. Uh, thanks very much, Nina. This has been. Uh, uh, I, I see there's two questions I can quickly address. Oh, please, them. yes. Uh, did, did so I miss the one is what impact will the crackdown have on China's innovation capabilities? Actually, I recently written about this. Um, I, I, I feel. Um, the, the crackdown is having uh, some uh, uh, noticeable negative impact on the innovation capabilities uh, of China. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, in certain places, um, in certain places, uh, China's entrepreneurship and um, the venture capital sector are remain to be very robust. So, um, oh. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, carry on, carry on. Okay, so um, so overall, um, uh, in some places, especially like capital markets in terms of Chinese tech companies aren't able to access the US IPO market. And therefore um, Chinese companies relying more on domestic capital rather than US dollar venture capital. Um, the, you know, the, the whole venture sector becoming sort of more inward looking that could be negative impact on the innovation ecosystem in China. But in some other places, um, like the softer uh, technology areas, uh, it will be uh, continue to be quite strong. And then lastly, about like optimisms for US-China uh, navigating uh, away from conflict. Um, I think we have to stay optimistic on this. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Otherwise, <again>. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise we'll, 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 we'll probably uh, be, the, be, the last, be the last world war um, before people use knives again to yeah. fight. Then, uh, then knives. <laughs> yeah. Um, or even silicon knives, who knows? <laughs> this is this is Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association. And I'd like to draw your attention to tomorrow's uh, briefing, where Holly McKay, uh, a member, a former member of the board, and a member is uh, in Kabul at the moment. Um, and in some ways, it's quieter in Kabul than it was before, was uh, the gist I was getting from her. But we'll get that conversation tomorrow from, from downtown Kabul, where she's talking, uh, where she's reporting on reporting, what it's like reporting under the Taliban, which you know, is probably easier than in China. At least she seems to get an outside link without difficulty. <laughs> but, um, well, well done. We look forward to hearing from Holly. We look forward to hearing from you all. And we look forward to you joining the Foreign Press Association and joining in with us in our program and coming up with innovations and look forward to hearing more from Nina about the um, never ending saga of China US technology wars. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.